Data Science Rabbit Podcast with Michael Bagelman. Welcome to the Data Science Rabbit Podcast, where we plunge headfirst into the digital war and of analytics, armed with nothing but our wits and a healthy dose of snark. I'm your host, Michael Bagelman, here to guide you through the labyrinth of ones and zeros. In today's episode, we're tackling the twin terrors of data science, burnout, and bad resumes. We'll explore the art of not losing your marbles in the high-stakes world of data crunching, and then we'll dissect the horrors of oversharing in your professional life story. Plus, our resident curmudgeon, Cornelius P. Snarkington, returns to bust the bubble of a classic marketing claim. So, grab your favorite caffeinated beverage, settle into your ergonomic chair, and prepare for a wild ride down the rabbit hole of data science. Introducing our latest sponsor, the Attention Mechanism, because focus is everything, even in AI. Why waste time looking at the whole input when you can zero in on what really matters? Attention Mechanism, teaching machines the art of selective listening since 2014. Remember, in the world of AI, it's not about how much you see, it's about where you look. Let's wade into the deep dark abyss of data science burnout. In the high-stakes world of data science, where algorithms are your lovers and data sets are your children, it's easy to lose your marbles faster than a neural network can overfit. Welcome to Burnoutville. Population, you, and every other caffeine-addled code monkey who thought they could outsmart sleep deprivation. Imagine this scene of digital despair. You're hunched over your keyboard, eyes redder than a poorly fitted regression line, surrounded by empty energy drink cans, muttering about p-values in your sleep. Congratulations, you've just won a one-way ticket to the data science psych ward. The amenities, about as appealing as a data set full of nulls. But fear not, my sleep-deprived comrades in code. I'm here to toss you a lifeline before you drown in a sea of semicolons and statistical significance. Let's start with a revolutionary concept. Going outside. I know, I know. Sunlight is to data scientists what garlic is to vampires. But hear me out. These precious moments away from your screen aren't just good for your vitamin D levels. They're like defragging your brain. Plus, you might actually recognize what trees look like without having to consult a random forest algorithm. Now, for you C-suite suits salivating over your next quarterly report, listen up. Investing in your data team's well-being isn't just some kumbaya HR bullshit. It's cold hard strategy. Think of it as upgrading from Windows ME to, well, literally anything else. Happy data scientists are productive data scientists, and productive data scientists make you money. It's not rocket science, unless of course you're actually working on rocket science. Here's a novel idea. Move your body. And no, furiously typing doesn't count as cardio. I'm not suggesting you train for an ultra marathon, though if that's your jam, go nuts. A quick walk, a stretch, or even a spirited game of how many times can I spin in my office chair before I projectile vomit can do wonders for your energy levels. Just try not to break anything, especially your already fragile ego. Your mental health is as crucial as knowing the difference between correlation and causation, and infinitely more complex than explaining to your cat why it can't sit on your keyboard. Even Sherlock Holmes needed his downtime, and he was solving murders, not trying to explain machine learning to Karen from marketing who still thinks Python is just a big snake. Watch out for those burnout red flags. If you're dreaming in Python or trying to chat with your spouse in SQL, it might be time to take a step back. Set boundaries like you're building a firewall for your sanity. Your worth isn't measured in lines of code or the size of your data sets. You're a human being, not a human doing, no matter what your imposter syndrome says. So here's your mission should you choose to accept it. Integrate some self-care into your data crunching routine. Maybe it's meditation. Maybe it's kickboxing. Or maybe it's just eating something that doesn't come in a wrapper with now with more caffeine emblazoned on it. Whatever it is, make it happen before you end up as an outlier in the data set of life. Keep in mind, in the grand algorithm of existence, your well-being is the most important variable. Don't let it be the outlier in your personal data set lest you find yourself debugging your own psyche at 3 a.m. on a Tuesday. What's your secret weapon against burnout? How do you keep your sanity intact when your code isn't? Share your burnout stories or survival tips on our social media or in the podcast comments. Let's build a support group for data scientists who occasionally recall they have a life outside of their laptop. Who knows, maybe we'll even start a Data Scientist Anonymous. Hi, I'm Bob, and it's been three days since my last unnecessary data visualization. 
And hey, if all else fails, just consider this. At least you're not in middle management. Those poor bastards don't even get the sweet, sweet dopamine hit of a successfully compiled program. Stay sane. Stay curious. And for the love of all that is holy, stay hydrated. Your kidneys will thank you, even if your deadline-obsessed project manager won't. Until next time, may your p-values be small, your data sets be clean, and your work-life balance be statistically significant. Now go outside, touch some grass, and remind yourself there's a life beyond the screen, you magnificent nerd. All right, data disciples, gather around for a tale of statistical seduction and analytical agony. Today, we plunge into the treacherous waters of A-B testing, where data-driven dreams often drown and marketers' souls are crushed under the weight of statistical significance. Picture this. You're a bright-eyed product manager armed with your fancy MBA and a burning desire to optimize the user experience. You decide to run an A-B test on your checkout button. Make it bigger, you cry, channeling your inner Silicon Valley visionary. The masses will flock to our digital emporium. Two weeks later, you're staring at results that make as much sense as a blockchain-powered toaster. Your conversion rate has shifted by 0.0001%, leaving you to reconsider that career in interpretive dance. But fear not, my statistically challenged friends, for I bring you the gospel of hypothesis-driven testing, a beacon of hope in the murky depths of inconclusive data. Step 1. Craft a hypothesis so clear even your CEO could understand it. None of this wishy-washy, improve user experience nonsense. We're talking specifics. If we enlarge our checkout button by 20%, we will increase sales conversion rates by 5%. Boom. Crystal clear, measurable, and just begging to be proven wrong. Now, here's where things get spicy. Once you've got your hypothesis, resist the urge to measure every damn thing under the sun. You're running an A-B test, not writing the next great American novel. Focus on the metrics that matter. If you're testing a checkout button, track sales. Don't get distracted by how many times users hover their cursor over the button while whispering sweet nothings to their screens. And for the love of all that is holy, please, please understand statistical significance. Just because your test shows a 5% lift doesn't mean it's time to pop the champagne and declare a victory. That could be about as meaningful as a politician's promise. Calculate your minimum sample size with the urgency of someone who's just realized their job depends on it. Because it probably does. Remember kids, A-B testing isn't about collecting data. It's about driving decisions. It's about separating the wheat from the chaff, the signal from the noise, the genuinely good ideas from the fever dreams of your UX designer who's been microdosing LSD. So the next time you're tempted to run an A-B test just because you can, ask yourself, am I ready to face the cold hard truth? Am I prepared for the possibility that my brilliant idea might be about as effective as a chocolate teapot? If the answer is yes, then by all means test away. But if you're just looking for data to confirm your biases, save yourself the trouble and go back to reading tea leaves. Now, I'd like to hear from you, my fellow data masochists. What's the most shocking A-B test you've ever encountered? Did your users favor buttons the color of baby puke? Or did your clever microcopy get trounced by click here, dummy? Share your tales of testing triumphs or tragedies in the comments. After all, in the world of A-B testing, we're all in this miserable mess together. In the grand A-B test of life, we're all just variables trying to avoid being filtered out. Now go forth and hypothesize, you beautiful data-driven bastards. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, allow me to introduce once more Cornelius P. Snarkington. Ah, dear listeners, gather round as Cornelius P. Snarkington takes you on a journey into the world of marketing myths and the curious case of four out of five dentists. Yes, that iconic tagline forever etched into our collective memory since 1976, when Trident surveyed 1,200 dentists about sugarless gum. But let us not be content with the surface. No, let us peel back the layers of this claim and see what's really going on behind the scenes. First and foremost, let's set the record straight. The advice given by those four dentists wasn't a blanket recommendation for everyone to rush out and buy sugarless gum. Rather, it was guidance specifically for patients already in the habit of chewing gum. 
And let's be clear, this wasn't an endorsement of Trident per se, but of sugarless gum in general. So, if you were envisioning a secret society of dentists with desks full of Trident, I regret to inform you that this is not the case. Now, let's talk about that lone dissenting dentist. Why four out of five rather than the more accurate 85%? Quite simply, it has a better ring to it, a classic case of marketing's flair for the dramatic. But it does make one wonder, what happened to those under the care of the fifth dentist? In truth, most of that 15% weren't endorsing any gum at all. Imagine being the poor child who, clutching their sugarless gum, is told by their dentist, no gum for you. A harsh reality indeed. And then there's the mystery of the survey details, never fully disclosed, leaving ample room for speculation and, dare I say, a chuckle or two, because why stop at 4 out of 5 when you could go for the elusive 5 out of 5 or even a 6 out of 5, but that of course would shatter the illusion of relatability, wouldn't it? It's the same logic behind shampoo ads claiming that 9 out of 10 women experienced amazing results, leaving us to wonder about the lone dissenter who presumably remains locked in battle with Frizz. But this tale, dear listeners, is not merely about gum. No, it's a masterclass in the power of data to validate and sell. Survey results, bestseller lists, you name it. Data offers a compelling narrative that consumers are primed to trust. It's a reminder that in the world of marketing, data can be as malleable as taffy, stretched and shaped to fit whatever story needs telling. So, the next time four out of five dentists comes up in conversation, remember the strategic marketing magic at play and spare a thought for that fifth dentist, forever shrouded in mystery. It's a perfect blend of data and storytelling, crafting a narrative that sticks, pun, most definitely intended. Until next time, keep your skepticism sharp, your questions probing, and remember, in the world of data and marketing, not everything is as it seems. This is Cornelius P. Snarkington, signing off. All right, you resume padding pansies, gather around. Today we're diving into the cesspool of career confessions known as resumes. Brace yourselves. It's time to trim the fat from your professional life story faster than a data scientist can say outlier detection. Let's start with a revolutionary concept. Your resume isn't an autobiographical manifesto, it's not your personal Wikipedia page, and it's certainly not a challenge to see how many irrelevant skills you can cram onto a single sheet of paper. It's a frickin' highlight reel, not the director's cut of your life. You know what hiring managers love? Relevance. You know what makes them want to gouge their eyes out with a rusty spoon? Your detailed account of how you single-handedly saved your high school's bake sale with your innovative approach to brownie distribution? Here's a wild idea. How about we focus on what actually matters? Your ability to wrangle data, not your ability to wrangle cattle. Your proficiency in R, not your proficiency in interpretive dance. Your experience with neural networks, not your experience with networking at your cousin's bar mitzvah. Let's break it down, shall we? Your SQL skills, hotter than an overclocked GPU. Your tuba polishing technique, about as useful as a screen door on a submarine. Your Python prowess, more attractive than free pizza at a hackathon. Your ability to photograph squirrels? Less interesting than watching paint dry in binary. Your machine learning models? Yes, please, inject that straight into my veins. Your interpretive dance routines? I'd rather debug a million lines of uncommented legacy code. Now I know what you're thinking, but how will they know I'm a well-rounded individual? Here's a secret. They don't care. They're not hiring you to be their new best friend. They're hiring you to do a job. Save your quirky personality traits for your Twitter bio. If you absolutely must include something to prove you're not a soulless data-crunching robot, keep it to one line at the bottom. And for the love of all that's holy, make it interesting. I juggle chainsaws while reciting the digits of pi will at least make me pause before I toss your resume into the circular file. I enjoy long walks on the beach. Congratulations, you've just described every boring date ever. You're applying to be a data scientist, not auditioning for the most generic human award. Your resume should read like a thrilling data visualization, not a mind-numbing spreadsheet of your entire existence. 
So here's your homework, you oversharing overachievers. Go home, look at your resume, and ask yourself one question for every single item. Does this make me look like a badass data scientist? If the answer is no, hit that delete key faster than you'd close a pop-up ad for hot singles in your area. Keep it relevant, keep it brief, and for the love of all that's holy, keep your marching band stories to yourself. Unless you used your tuba to create a revolutionary new algorithm for sound wave analysis, in which carry on, you beautiful weirdo. Now I want to hear your resume horror stories. What's the most ridiculous, irrelevant, or downright bizarre thing you've seen on a data science resume? Drop it in the comments. Bonus points if it made you question the very nature of human intelligence. Who knows, maybe we'll compile them all into a what-not-to-do guide for the next generation of data scientists. After all, your embarrassment is our entertainment. In the cutthroat world of data science recruitment, your resume is your battle armor. Don't show up to the fight wearing a clown suit. Unless, of course, you're applying for a position as a data scientist at Cirque du Soleil. In which case, juggle away, you magnificent statistical jester. This has been the Data Science Rapid Podcast, where we dive deep into the war of analytics. If you enjoyed this twisted trip down the data burrow, why not hit that subscribe button? It's free, and unlike most things in life, it won't corrupt your data set. For more of my questionable wisdom, follow me, Michael Bagelman, on LinkedIn. I promise my posts are shorter than this podcast and only slightly less unhinged. Or, if you're feeling particularly brave, venture to datasciencerabbithole.com. Just don't blame me if you emerge with an unhealthy obsession for p-values and a newfound distrust of pie charts. Until next time, keep your algorithms sharp and your biases checked. This has been the Data Science Rabbit Podcast, hosted by Michael Bagelman. Find the Data Science Rabbit Podcast on all your favorite social media, including YouTube and TikTok. Follow Michael on LinkedIn or visit datasciencerabbithole.com. Thank you.